Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Blow, and welcome to Prime. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin has made it crystal clear to President Biden and fellow Democrats that he will not support the $3.5 trillion in spending on Biden's Build Back Better plan. According to a memorandum of understanding signed by Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, dated July 28th, by the way, the West Virginia Senator's ceiling for the reconciliation bill was $1.5 trillion. This figure puts Manchin and progressive Democrats $2 trillion apart on the social safety net agreement. Manchin has said that one of the primary reasons for his objection to the bill's price tag is the amount the government spent on pandemic relief. He made this point on CNN's State of the Union earlier this month. He will not have my vote on 3.5, and Chuck knows that, and we've talked about this. Um, we've already put out 5.4 trillion, and we try to help Americans in every way we possibly can. And a lot of the help that we put out there is still there. Biden's plan would fund things like Medicaid and child tax credit expansion, universal pre-K, free community college, and funding for elder care, among other benefits. All of this would immensely benefit, disproportionately benefit, the black and brown and impoverished communities. Manchin's proposed cut to $1.5 trillion would severely reduce the bill's impact on those communities. The battle over the reconciliation bill has highlighted a civil war within the Democratic Party. The conflict pits a group of mostly white moderates against a diverse group of progressives with each side seemingly representing the interests of those they resemble. Joining us to discuss is senior writer for The Root, Michael Harriet. So, Michael, uh, Manchin's home state of West Virginia has a poverty rate of 16%. The larger price tag would help his constituents. Why are they not more angry that he is resisting the bigger bill? I guess it's for the same reason that his state voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump, right? We know that poor white people have been duped into thinking that the Republican Party is helping them and somehow Democrats are taking all the white people's money and giving it to black people. So that's part of the reason, right? And there are no black people, uh, you know, substantively in West Virginia. So that's that's a big reason why he can do this because he has a state which is like one of the top three states in poverty, one of the top three states in stuff like uh, childhood pregnancy, teen pregnancy, drug use. But they still have that misconception that the Democrats are spending, giving their money to black people or giving their money away because they have this weird thing about uh, black people get entitlements, but it's, you know, government help when it's when white people get it. So, so this thing is coming down to the wire. Who do you think has the most steel in their spine? The moderates or the progressive? Who do you think is going to bend and give and who is going to hold out? Well, I think that, you know, we see that most of the Democratic Party is behind this bill, right? So, you know, Politically and pragmatically, do can one dude hold up a bill that the entirety of his party, you know, wants to pass? So, you know, if if it were me, and if I were a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, if I was a member of the progressive uh, wing of the party, I would say I would go to him with the threat. I think we are going and in, getting to, into the phase where. You know, we're seeing the public threats against Joe Manchin, and we're seeing him being derided publicly and, and, and blamed publicly for this stalling. And so I would be going to Joe Manchin, and I would say publicly that they will never get a— West Virginia would never get a—I would never vote for a penny to go to West Virginia on any bill for the rest of my tenure in Congress if Joe Manchin blocks this bill. You know, I think we're getting to that level right now. Joining the discussion now is president of Repairs of the Breach, Bishop William Barber. You know, Bishop Barber, th we're, we're down to the wire here. Uh, someone has to give or else we are not going to have a bill. Do you believe that either the moderates or the progressives have it in them to hold out and not to pass anything, not to give, 
and to you know basically doom the Biden agenda, which would be political suicide. There's no other way to describe it. Well, that is one way of looking at it, but I think sometimes you have to go all the way down to the wire and let something die in order for something else to resurrect. You know, I come from that faith tradition. So let's just say you don't, um, um, this is a test of will. We're in a crisis of democracy. And Joe Manchin wants that infrastructure bill because one of the things is going to pay a lot of his friends off. Um, we should have jumped him and the Black Caucus and everybody when they blocked $15 living wage. That's when we should have held our ground. Schumer should have allowed that bill to go to the floor and made him have to vote against raising people's living wage. And he would not have, have, have voted against the COVID relief if he had been pushed that far. But they let him off the hook thinking that him, he and Senate, that they couldn't trust them. Well, now I think Jaya Paul and others have to hold, uh, and you can always reconsider later. Let's remember, in, in, they, in, in Congress, they can do anything they want to do, but the crisis needs to be played all the way out. We, we can't afford for the crisis, excuse me, not to be played all the way out in the system. Now, I do have a little bit of a different opinion. Uh, ben, my dear brother, and I thank God for him. The folk in West Virginia, 70% of them are not with Ma Manchin. The people in the hills, white folk, are not with Manchin. The people that, that Manchin gets in office because of the number of poor white folk who just don't vote. Remember, the data actually tells us that poor and low wealth white folk, when they vote, they do not vote for Trumpism. They vote progressive. But they don't vote a lot of them because they don't see Democrats talking to them. Part of the problem Democrats have right now is their messaging. Every press conference they're having now, they ought to have white folk from Appalachia. They ought to have Latinos from Arizona at those press conferences. They ought to have black folk. The black caucus ought to be right out there with the progressive caucus saying no to this. Because Step Cinema has 3 million poor and low-wealth people in her state and 1.3 million people who make less than 15. That's who we ought to have in front of the mics. We offered that to the White House, by the way, Charles. You saw that. We said to the White House, let us bring to you a geographically diverse racially group of poor and low wealth folks to the White House and economists. They meet right. the president and let them come out and go to the mic and let the issue be mansion and cinema against them, not mansion and cinema against Biden, not mansion and cinema against the progressive, not a moderate because he's not a moderate. He's a, at best right. an obstructionist and at worst a corporate oper corporate operative. The problem too often with Democrats is messaging. I don't know why in the world they claim to be wanting to help low wealth people and won't let low wealth folk talk. That's the problem. What in the hell? Excuse me, mm, Lord. Right. What in the world is wrong when you won't let the people <laughs> who you claim you care about take the mic and make the moral case? So I'm 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 believing we can not they hold the line and then come back for reconsideration, and, but then have a moral reset. I get that. Michael, it is impossible to argue that, that what, what the bishop is saying is not true. The messaging has been off. But it's just, we can't fix it now, right? Not between the now and the time they take the vote. Do, do, are we in a situation where the best we can do is have some, a game of chicken, basically? You know, see who's going to stare the other person down. Because as the bishop says, you know, you have to play it all the way out. You have to maintain your position as long as you can maintain it. But it seems to me that what we're what, what Pelosi was hinting at today at her press conference was, I get it. They have to go the distance, but eventually someone or everyone will bend. But well, I, I tend to agree with uh, the, the Reverend Barber, right? And and, and I want to make sure we understand that I was talking about voters versus the constituents, and Reverend Barber okay. is white. But I, I tend to agree with him that. Let it die, right? Because what you're talking about is the choice of giving white people what they want and pushing black people and poor wealth people to the side again, right? So let it die because the truth is, as as Reverend Barber pointed out, no one really wants this bill to die. The Republicans don't want to take the blame for this infrastructure bill 
dying. The moderate Democrats don't want to take the blame. Joe Manchin doesn't want to take the blame. He just doesn't want to give the people, the low wealth people and the people that don't affect his his day to day life what they want. And he, so he can be able to say that he's a moderate and he kept the fiscal conservatism and fiscal responsibility in check. But the truth is, no one, not even the Republicans, not the Democrats, not the moderates, none of them really want this bill to fail. It's a political exercise in nihilism. So I say let it fail, right? And everybody will know whose fault it is, right? Because all of the Democrats were standing in line, ready to vote for it. The progressives were, st were had given, had created a bill that would give Joe Manchin what he wants and give poor people what they want. And what they're saying now is, we don't want to give the poor people what they want. So let it die. And Charles, so, can I so say... So Bishop Michael says, Michael says, Michael says, let it die. It would only take four or five uh, uh, no votes from Democrats for it to go down. Are there four or five people uh, in the House who, are, who would say, I am willing to tank the Biden agenda, which is basically what you're going to have to say uh, to, to make yeah. this right. Well, they shouldn't do it that way. They shouldn't say they should have a major press conference tomorrow or next day with as many people that would be impacted. And first of all, say this is who Mansion Cinema and the Republicans are against. Then they should say we're going to let this die, but we're not going to let the process die. Because why do we, they can reconsider? They can have a bill come up next session. We a lot of this stuff we say as, as though it's true. It's like you can't pass anything during election season. Why? There were bills in civil rights movement that you that died, and then something better came back. I mean, or, or sometimes you passed a lesser piece, and then something better. We've gotten locked into their game, and part of what this is breaking the game wide open, saying we're not going to play your game anymore because it's not a game for the people that don't have health care and living wages. It's not a right. game for the people that will face the bulk of climate change problems. It's not a game for those that need housing. So I don't think we have to speak in these ultimatum terms. I think that what they're saying is it, $3.5 trillion, according to the Economic Policy Institute, is $6 trillion below what we actually need. Let's start there. It's $6 trillion below. Right. We already watched a cinema and mansion block living wages for 32 million people. How much more damage are you going to allow? And if you give them this infrastructure, and most of it's going to corporate people, it's not going to lift poor and low wealth people and working people. If you give up now, then they will always know they can just take you to the edge. This is a crisis of right. civilization we're in the middle of. It's not a normal battle. So right. I say fight hard. Let it die if necessary. Force it back to the table. But then the last thing, Charles, President Biden, if, if even if tomorrow they table it, should get on the road. You've met with Manchester. Go to Arizona. Go to West Virginia. Go to Texas. And then go to the well of the Congress and say three things we got to do. Protect the infrastructure of our democracy, voting rights, the infrastructure of our daily lives to build back better, and the infrastructure of our roads and bridges. And this is what we're going to fight for. And you know, if the American people yeah. see that, they may not, they may not turn on him. They may be glad that finally we have a fight. Yeah, Bi Biden promised to get on the road for voting rights. He didn't do that either. I'm not sure he's a get on the road type of guy. <laughs> well, anyway, Bishop Barber yeah. and Michael Harriet, thank you both for joining me. Always a pleasure.